Hey everybody, welcome to the Oscars Roundtable presented by Biola Cinema and Media Arts. Today we have some awesome guests and let me introduce them. First we have Claudia Puig. She is the president of the Los Angeles Critics Association and a great film credit critic, does NPR, formerly of USA Today, awesome. Mm -hmm. We also have Nancy Yoon, uh, a sociologist and professor here at Biola and author of the book Real Inequality. We have Justin Chang, he's a film critic with the Los Angeles Times, and I am Camille Tucker, a screenwriter and screenwriting professor here at Biola University. So let me start off with the first question. So I wanna just kind of break the ice here. We know that there, we have our best picture noms and there's best actor and there's a all bunch of excitement about the Oscars coming up. But what film do you feel is the most overlooked or the film that you feel got the biggest snub for possibly best picture for this year? One film, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, like try to pick like, is there a film that you think you're just like, this film should have gotten nominated for best picture? Well, I was going to scandalize everyone by saying <laughs> Mother, Mother? Okay. Aronofsky's film, which I love and which actually does deserve a Best Picture nomination. <laughs> I think it was overlooked for, for everything. But I would say my, my serious, my real answer is um, The Florida Project. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. I should say Mother and let you guys talk about that. <laughs> I would have said Wind River for second, but Florida Project. Oh, yeah. 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 No, yeah. I, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Okay, so I'm glad you said that. Now, I haven't seen The Florida Pro Project, but what I want to know first, because I want to talk about The Florida Project, is what is it about mother that you feel? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, like, do you have mother, mother issues? <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, the, the, you know, the audience has mother issues. I do not. I think it's great. Um, but I just thought, you know, I have not always been a Darren Aronofsky fan, even though I, th I think he's always been a talented director. And I know he's kind of going, you know, deep into kind of, you know, his own posterior in this movie, sort of like, sort of, you know, it's like dredging deep into, you know, he's starring his now former, uh, former uh, uh, partner, Je Jer Jennifer Lawrence, in this role, in this movie that is this kind of like phantasmagorical, you know, horror, thriller, very perverse, very off-putting to, I think, anyone who is not used to, you know, something that is very experimental in nature and sensibility. So, but I just loved it. I think it's really, it held me at every moment. Um, I think it's, really kind of beautiful, ter terrifying film. Um, you know, kind of, you know, Hieronymus Bosch kind of style imagery. I just think it's really, I know, it's, it, it's a trip. It's a really mm -hmm. trippy movie. I actually think, you know, it's, there are cosmic elements to it where it's, you know, it is kind of nakedly so a, a biblical allegory. You know, it's mm -hmm. an allegory about the That's creation nice of the world, that. the destruction of the world. And it's doing it in a kind of way, because, you know, Darren Aronofsky, who's just coming off Noah, um, mm -hmm. right. you know, which is very kind of, you know, and, and then doing this, it's like he is not a believer himself, but he's really engaging with you know, the text yeah. in a really interesting yeah. way. And so in a very subversive and irreverent kind of way. But I love that. I think he's really um, so... Um, yeah, I, it's a movie I sort of do love to in part just because so many people hated it. <laughs> You're we contrarian. Have <laughs> Normally not, but in this case, I yeah, think it's great. No. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, interesting. And what about the Florida Project? I'd love to hear why you thought that was overlooked for the Oscars. You know, it was such a humane film. And, and at the center of it, sort of the spiritual or, or sort of um, human heart, beating heart of it, is Willem Dafoe, who did get nominated for yep. Best Supporting Actor, rightly so, and I wish he would win, although I don't think he will. Mm -hmm. But um, he is kind of a surrogate father to these kids and to even the, the adults in a way. He's kind of their... You know, uh, he's kind to, to people who are just on the margins. It's kind of the people who are a step away from being homeless. And they're just, you know, they're, they're barely eking out a living. And you see them, you, these are people that we don't see. We don't see them in, the, in movies. We drive by them. So mm -hmm. it's a look, and a very humane look, at this particular section of the population, which unfortunately is growing. Um, and you know, people on the street, of course, there's more and more of those. So I, th I feel like it's a, it's a film that needs to be seen and it's a very lovely, emotional film and it's an honest film. It's just, it's got so much going for it. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that you said people that we don't normally see represented in the media because actually, and you just wrote an article about how what the criteria for best picture is changing and that we're seeing these smaller, more indie, more character driven films Films, films with characters that we don't normally see. I saw it last so, year with Moonlight. But I think that's time. interesting that some of them are getting nominated for Best Picture, but then the Florida Project was overlooked. 
Um, was there anything you wanted to add with that, Nancy? Yeah, so as a it? sociologist, I really found that um, actually Florida Project is part of a pattern of like white working class culture. Uh, Florida Project had some diversity. Um, there was a Latina friend. Um, but I think that watching it made me really feel like it's, it's like you said, a, a kind of an underclass that's the story that's not told. Like I didn't think about, you know, the folks that, that live, that permanently live in motels because they can't afford housing. And, and the fact that there were, it was centered on children, but not done in a cutesy way, it really was so uh, raw and painful just because it really, these are, there are kids that are in these positions. And, and I felt that, yeah, that watching it, it was part of a, um, a trend that was happening this, this season. So I was really surprised that it didn't get nominated. Yeah, because Three Billboards is actually about oh, yes. very similar right. section of, you know, white working class people. And everybody loves that movie. Mm -hmm. yes. And so why did we focus so much on that and not on Florida Project? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, along with that, you're absolutely right. There's also, I would say there are three notable films this year, and not the only ones by far, but the ones that got kind of the most attention, um, focusing on kind of white working class narratives. And they were Three Billboards, The Florida Project, and I, Tanya. Mm -hmm. And I, Tanya, which is, you know, which I'm not crazy about, but which is an interesting look at class. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's exactly the heart of that movie. But it's interesting how I think here the Academy and other awards uh, voting bodies really went for the two movies that were sort of very kind of entertaining in an exaggerated, somewhat flashy. theatrical kind of way, very flashy. Yeah. The Florida Project to me is almost like, it's a great neorealist film in yes. a way. I mean, it's very, yes. it's, 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 it's it, to me it harks theme. back, it, it, it harks back to that. Theme. And yeah, it has exactly. absolutely Sean Baker's own sensibility to it, yeah. which is like, cause there's also this kind of joyous fantasy like quality. I mean, what's so exciting about that movie is the way there's this sort of straight realism and yet this also just, Partly because the motel is purple. It just kind of, uh, it just, the whole thing is just like this kind of sugary, bright it's called the magic color. Castle, it's the magic castle. Yeah. There's, this, there's this like sugar rush you get watching yeah. the movie. It's yeah. like so, it's a weird mix. Um, but I think it's, and, and I think a completely accessible movie that just not enough people saw, and it does because it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a much more honest film than either of those other two. Yes. And I think people sometimes don't want to be seen. Absolutely. I think that's the thing. The other yeah. two are more obvious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about, um, white uh, working class narratives. And one thing we know is that a few years ago, there was the whole Oscar so white. Um, and there's more diversity in the nominees for this year. We have Get Out, we have Mudbound. Um, so what do you think about the fact that there is more diversity? Do you think that it's attributed to, I know Cheryl Boone Isaacs, um, initiated, she got a whole bunch of new voting members for the Academy. Do you think that has some play in it? Um, what are we seeing now as this trend? I think, yes, they're, they're definitely, the, the makeup of the Academy is changing. They have brought in many more people of color. They brought in younger people, brought in more women. There's an initiative. They're still not anywhere near where they should be, uh, but they're better. So I think that is a large part of it. And I think just the attention paid to the whole Oscar so white. We saw the change began last year. And with the fact that Moonlight won, which was, you know, huge against La La Land, which was the ultimate Oscar so white kind of movie, right? <laughs> um, but so I think that that, you know, we're probably never going to see an Oscar so white of that ilk again mm -hmm. because of the changing nature of the Academy and just the awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, Nancy, you do a lot of work with um, images of, and diverse images in the media. And um, is there anything that you wanted to ask regarding that? Yeah, so I think that uh, things are getting better. But I just saw an article yesterday where they interviewed, I think it was Variety, interviewed these young voters, right? And one of them said something that was so disturbing to me. Um, it said that, that he said that um, he was talking to some older uh, Oscar voters that were dismissing Get Out altogether, and they hadn't even seen it. They were just Ooh. like, it's not an Oscar, Oscar film, right? But they hadn't seen it. Because so, it was a horror film? Was that their thing? I think they had, they, there was misunderstandings about the film. Obviously, they hadn't seen it, so it was just based on some idea of what the film is. Was that, um, it might have been the Hollywood Reporter's brutally honest Oscar ballot story. It was one of the, I can't, yeah. I think, yeah, it was, um, I think I saw that too, and it's just, I think it's a sign, you know, you hope it's not representative of the Academy. I mean, look. I hope it's the, just those couple of people. No, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But I mean, the Academy has always, I think for 90 years, has had people who don't do their homework and who, you know, it's, yeah. these are, it's, no, I mean, 
Claudia and I are critics, so we see everything. It's like, and the Academy members are filmmakers. They genuinely don't have the time, right. they don't make the time to see everything. And unfortunately, that's when the biases come out. It kind of reminds me even of you know years ago when a lot of people were rejecting Brokeback Mountain because they didn't want to see a gay film. And so, and now I think that has passed, I think, thankfully, um, but where people are just not even willing to watch it and make up their minds, you know? And so I think with Get Out, yeah, it's, you know, it's a film that, uh, you know, it's, you know, this scalding racial commentary, but it's also a genre movie, and so that prejudice, I think. Right. And there, there's know, two prejudices. Yeah, I was gonna say, we don't know, yeah. can, people could say, oh, it's because I don't want to see horror movies, when in fact they could be racist. You know, who knows sure what enough. they're, yeah. you know, or both. They may hate <laughs> horror movies and be racist, exactly. but I think that that has been the biggest problem for Get Out, is that people say, and I've, I've heard people who are, I know are not racist, who are, are well-meaning say, oh no, I'm scared, I'm scared yeah. to see it. Yeah. You know, it's not a and scary movie. And it's not movie. really a horror no. movie. It's more of a suspense film, I feel like. Yes. Um, but that also leads to a great conversation about Best Picture and how there's just an interesting mix of nominations this year. So I'd love to hear each person's, like, what is your pick for, for Best Picture? Which film do you want to win and We just why? said it. Get Out. <laughs> you want Get Out I to win? I totally want Get Out to win. Mm -hmm. um, why? <laughs> because it's what it has to say about racism. And I feel like it's an important film. It's also my favorite film in terms of entertaining. I've seen it three times. I don't know that I could say that about, I've seen a couple of the other ones twice. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like Jordan Peele made a really great movie and it was well written, well acted. It went in surprising directions. It has, a, but most importantly, it has a lot to say about you know, where we are in this country. I think he tapped into a lot. He totally of, did, but yeah. I also love Lady Bird, so I would be very yeah. happy to see Lady Bird too win. Those are, those are my two favorites. Nancy. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, wow. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I saw, you know, it's, it's, it's been a year, over a year since, um, since it came out. So it, the, the kind of timing of it is very interesting that it's nominated because it isn't, you know, it wasn't kind of leading up to the Oscar season like a lot of these other films. But I, I remember seeing the trailer for it and seeing that this yeah. is a horror film, you know, uh, about racism. And I thought, Oh my gosh, that's brilliant! <laughs> you know, yeah. no one's ever thought about that before yeah. because racism it is horror. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so, but I love the kind of social commentary and the cleverness of um, turning things on its head, and I, it just it made me think about so many things. But I, I found it interesting in an audience where where people were laughing at certain parts, and I think people were seeing it through their lenses and their kind of social lenses. And I find that really interesting that a lot of white audiences saw it and enjoyed it, even though I felt like it was such a critique on society. I just, I, I think he did such a great job because it's, it's, it's scary sort of, but it's also funny. Mm -hmm. And yes. I think that Melding it, it makes humor. it very digestible to yeah. a general audience, something that is um, actually critical, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not scary in the traditional sense that we think of horror More films. like Rosemary's like Baby or yeah, yeah that yeah. kind yeah. of yeah. Just someone running across the thriller. screen with a dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> it has jolts like the deer yeah. scene or whatever. Absolutely. But that yeah. final scene where you know he's forced to, uh, spoiler alert yeah. for those who haven't seen it, um, you know, where he is forced to do some uh, more gruesome things and the the police lights come up. You can just oh, feel the collective groan in the audience. Yes. It's like a black man, dead bodies. We know where this is going, and it doesn't. Right. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, just, I love you've seen the. It. Have you seen the alternative ending? Well, I've yeah, heard no, about that. I, is, I actually have it's, it's, there's, Yeah, they, they shot um, a, at us. least one other ending where, and it's online. It's you can watch grim. it. It's much grimmer. Yeah. He winds up behind bars. Yeah. So he was it's, the, it's, is, yeah. it's more it is realistic. The it is, it is, it is yeah. the police, wow. and which would have ended things did on they, a very... Did they run it by like a, a focus group They probably did to? test it, and I think that, and I love the ending as is. I love you know, the ending as is. I think it. you could go either way. Either I, way sends a powerful statement, yeah. but they end with, you know, the the hard-earned victory, and the, you know, he, survi you know, he survives. Yes. It's like that, you need that after yes. what he's been through. But the other one might have been your, more realistic. A more realistic, more, you know, kind of a more tragic ending, but... The other one is a Hollywood ending. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what he, what Jordan Peele does in Get Out is really brilliant and subversive. And it, in a way, in a way, you watch it and you think like, why has no one thought of this before? Yes. It's it, it just seems so obvious using, you know, genre has always been a way to provide a window into deeper meaning. And here he, you know, he takes, you know, sort of the the, the kicks and the thrills of, of, a, of a horror or a suspense movie and gives them this, you know, laces them with this commentary in a brilliant way. I, I love the movie. Um, it's not my favorite of the nominees. I would, my choice, I'm, I'm evenly torn between uh, Call Me By Your Name and Phantom Thread for Best Picture. Ooh, um, neither of which I think fancy. has a shot. I actually think Got Get Out has a pretty good shot at winning. I think it's, I, I would say it's not even that much of a 
it would not be as jolting a surprise as I think it might have been at the beginning of last year. I actually think it has a really good shot. It's going to get a lot of votes. I don't think the other two do. Tell me what you love about Phantom Thread because I enjoyed the film, mm -hmm. but in terms of Daniel Day Lewis, I, I don't, and I, oh, this sounds like maybe this is sacrilegious, but I don't know that it was Daniel Day Lewis's best work to me. Yeah, I don't so. know if it was either. I, don't, I mean, and that's, and hey, that's, that's, that's a very high bar. You know, not, that's something that <laughs> know, we're talking about. I think it's a great performance, but I don't think he, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily there will be blood or Lincoln or something. Right. Um, but I think it's a fascinating character. But I, to me, it's the women in that movie who are fascinating. I mean, that is the mm, thing. It's And, and I think that it yeah. could be perceived as this sort of, you know, some people, I think some people have are not crazy about the movie because they think it, you know, as Claudia, uh, Claudia who, because it kind of, this this kind of portrait of, of this, of this. Tortured male genius. Tortured male so genius. <laughs> but, they're so over it. And I, and that's, but I think that the movie Subverts, subverts okay. that narrative yeah, completely. Kind For me, of, yes. I think it's about the women who are fascinating that movie. Vicka Creeps, who is not nominated, but I think should be. I, I think, think she, Leslie Manville is a Leslie movie. Manville is my yeah. favorite nominee in the Best Supporting yeah. Actress yeah. category. So I think, and I think she's a wonderful actress. But anyways, I find that movie just, um, yeah. I, 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 it's funny, we're talking about this. I am taking my wife to see it tonight with the live orchestra. Uh, really? Performance of Johnny Greenwood's oh, score Johnny is Greenwood. really, wow. and so I'm really excited to see that. Where is um, that? It's at the Ace Hotel downtown. Oh, okay. So um, I, I, it'll be my third time seeing it. The movie for me gets better and better every I think time. three times is the key. When you see something yes. three times, you know you love it. Yeah. Same with Moonlight last year. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the woman who, the final statement is very much, you know, the woman who's sort of wielding the power at the end of right. the film. And some might say, that the way she does it, some might argue, well, without giving spoilers, that there's something no. misogynistic about that, but I don't know. I think it's I think it's like she has in some ways defined herself as much uh, sort of an artist in the relationship <laughs> as he is. You know, I wish so. we'd known more about her. My problem with her character is that no. she just kind of arose out of you know whole cloth, and it's like she's a waitress. Suddenly she's you know with him. She's modeling clothes. We knew nothing about her background. That's her background. Her background. She has this Luxembourgish accent, yeah, which yeah. is, you know, where did the that come from? Was never and they talk so, about, they yeah. say something about where you come from. Someone yeah. was making a critique about her. Or where the, the, the race, but they didn't the, exactly. ever say really yeah. where she came right, from. Right, right. Yeah. And um, then all of a sudden she's kind of help, com, helping to run the company. It's like she didn't but, exist until she met the man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I would love to see Get Out when I would. I, for a lot of the same reasons that everyone says. When you say that, you know, someone said he'd never done that before, I'm like, why couldn't I write that film? <laughs> like, you know, well, someone should have done it before. But just mixing genres, I think that that's something that we're gonna, you know, we're seeing much more. Like sure. taking hybrids. certain genres, hybrid genres that we haven't seen before and then make, creating fresh voices and films that we see. Um, but one other thing I wanted to ask when we're talking about diversity, um, and Nancy, what you write about so much, we haven't really seen any notable Asian American or Latino Americans nominated this year, I don't think. Nope. So I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, about that. I think that. Uh, in terms of Golden Globes, there was Hong Chao for um, downsizing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know how I feel about that. Yeah. Same so, here, oh my God, really. Yes. Yeah, no, no, but, sure. um, but there was a chance, and I'm like, yes, go for it, you know? <laughs> well, Ocha, there was a chance with Ocha. Mm, I wish true. that had been nominated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that, uh, yeah, but that we are just, we're really behind in terms of, like it's been 17 years since a Latinx uh, indigenous or um, Asian American actor wow. has been has has 17 won years. seventeen Demian years. Demian Bichir, I'm I'm Mexican American, so Demian Bichir is the only Mexican actor, Mexican American actor that has been nominated in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Of course, didn't win for what, uh, for, which, for a better for life. life. Yeah. He, yeah, a movie nobody saw. Mm -hmm. He was fantastic. He's wonderful in it. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, at least there's a couple uh, Native Americans, Asians. Mexican Americans were woefully underrepresented. Yeah, it's been 60 years since an Asian woman has won an Oscar. 60 years. A Latina years. never has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not, unless yeah. you have Penelope Cruz, but she's no. European. Oh, I think um, there was uh, the Cuban American uh, in Fisher King. It was um, Mercedes. Mercedes Rule. She was Mercedes Cuban? Yeah, she's I part Cuban. Okay. So, so we've, we've, we've made some progress. We have a ways to go. Um, Should we just chime in? You know, Guillermo del Toro, the front runner for best director. Oh, there's Mexican, is Mexican directors, directors, but they're not directors, Mexican American. Right, right. Mexican, sure, sure, yeah. exactly. Foreign born. And by the way, and, I just, yeah, as, no. a, as a little thing, they and don't hire Latinos. Yeah. They don't hire other Mexican Americans. Um, mm -hmm. Not in front of the camera, not behind the camera, which is a big issue. And I know there's there's some efforts. The National Hispanic Media Coalition is going is protested that at mm -hmm. the Oscars mm -hmm. lunch. They will continue to kind of 
ask Guillermo and all those people who I love Guillermo del Toro. Pan's Labyrinth yeah. is one of the best movies I've ever seen. Yes. I want to ask Claudia with the question if I do Mike. It's, sure. it's interesting of this because I, I totally get the, 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 who they hire, the labor issues. But then on the other side, sometimes I know that they've criticized Guillermo and also Alejandro Giannaritu and um, Alfonso Cuarón, three best director winners, yes. you know, and the, or, well, Guillermo will be, but the other two yes, have one director yes, right. um, for telling these stories that are not, you know, Latino inherently stories. Latino stories. Except and for Itumama también. Except for uh, yeah. short. Oh, yeah, but the ones yeah. that they've won for. Yeah. You know, I mean, The Revenant has some. You know, there's there's Native American uh, characters. It's a, it's a it's you know it's a it's a frontier west. You know, it's a western. Um, but do you have an issue with? I mean, I get kind of defensive whether the movies are any good or not. I feel like they should have the right to tell Absolutely. stories, and they don't have to tell Absolutely. stories that are. Like that well, Lee you know, Unkrich yeah. directed Coco, which, by the way, is the right. film that you know a lot of us <laughs> are rooting for because of, of how it respectfully handled um, you know, a Mexican holiday and how, it, how it, in a time when Mexicans and Mexican Americans have been so maligned by our government and, or the leader of our government. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was directed by Leon Critch, who's not Latino, and he brought in some, uh, some consultants. Um, but no, I think everybody should be allowed, and, and getting, we sure. talked about Detroit off camera, you know, that was directed by a white woman. And I think that, I think everybody, everybody should be able to direct whatever they want to right, direct. Right, to tell the course. stories that they're, I, I yes. know as a content creator and as a screenwriter, I don't want to feel limited that someone, when they see me, says, oh, she can only write African-American yes, characters, right. and I don't think it should, either way, no. but I think that you have to have a respect and often there's a lot of research or just being with Absolutely. you know, people and really going deep if that's yes. the story that research you Research and bringing in other people. Right. I mean, if you have like an all white, you know, lily white uh, production and you're doing a, a black story, I would say probably not a great idea. The same with any, you know, if, if Coco hadn't brought in the people that it brought in. But I think mm -hmm. when you when you mix everybody up, I mean, ideally what we want is a diverse world. Right? Yeah, we want diversity. And filmmaking is such a collaborative yes. thing. Obviously, it's like it's ideally suited for that. Yes, so, it really right, is yeah. ideally suited. I want to throw out one more question, and then I don't know if you have any, but just to for everybody to shift gears a little bit. What do you feel is the most spiritually significant film of 2017? I'd love to hear from each of you. So I just saw Mudbound yesterday, and I don't know if it's the most spiritual, but I was surprised that um, no one had said anything about Mudbound depicting a black family in which the father is a preacher, and there are actually several scenes in which he quotes the Bible, and even a really cute one where between him and his and Mary J. Blige's character, they're they're married, and they he's kind of like you know you need to obey the husband. And she's like you know a, 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 a wise wife, you know you, a wonderful wife. You can't you know you, you you need to appreciate. So they're like quoting the Bible back and forth, mm -hmm. and it was a very sweet moment that they actually used. Um, just their faith as a way to develop their character. So, and I hadn't heard anybody say that Mudbound is, you know, this kind of spirit mm -hmm. that that even anything religious was part of that film. So I was surprised, and I was I, I liked the way that it was incorporated. And then, and then I don't want to do any spoilers, but uh, there was a scene in which yes. there 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 is someone evil, and then there is uh, there is and and the 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 preacher the, the character he actually is. At, asked to help bury the evil person and then say something and and I like the way that he kind of through his kind of his funeral last funeral rites yeah. really gave it a social critique so it was a kind of a sophisticated like he was still a man of god right. but he was not going to let evil just go without yeah. kind of anything said so right mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think in some ways um ladybird was and it, although it's a very secular story and there's mm -hmm. not it, it, any really reference to, to religion per se, but I think the idea of a parent-child relationship is something really important and how uh, you understanding both the mother understanding her child, the daughter understanding her mother, and you know the father is a very, very mm -hmm. kind sort of spiritual character. I just found that to be maybe more ethical, but I, just it, to me it had like a spiritual resonance. Yeah. It really does. I mean, just to build off that, Claudia, I had the pleasure of actually interviewing Greta Gerwig shortly after the film was, you know, not too long ago. And of course, she's um, Catholic. She's got, yeah. uh, she's, you know, she's, I think she's United Universalist and believe it or not, she, she had this Catholic school. She went to Catholic school. She went to Catholic school, right. but she's You're actually not Catholic. Right. She is but no, not Catholic, but yes. It's kind yeah. of, you know, and she has this, you know, you see in the movie, she has this kind of ambivalent relationship to Catholicism. Right. But it's very affectionate as well. And she was, you know, and I wanted to, because I think Lady Bird is a hugely spiritually resonant film. 
And there's this sense in which by the end of the film, you know, even though she's sort of rejected her Catholic school, she hates, you know, I think she has come to kind of appreciate some kind of sense of higher purpose, some, some kind of presence of something divine in her life. And um, you know, even just the way that uh, Greta Gerwig portrays the nuns in the movie, Lois Smith, Lois Smith yeah. as Sister Sarah Joan, the, the in a very the warm, very warm, loving, open way. And Greta Gerwig said, "It's like it's very, it yeah. very much comes from she like, and she actually read like I think biographies of the saints in preparation. Yes. The character's name is yes. Christine. It's yeah. not an accident. So it's like, right. you know, and it's she owns very, her name at the end. Christine. Absolutely, she does, and she talks about how Catholic school was really. I went to twelve years of Catholic school, and and that movie resonated for me because we had those kinds of very, you know, the very kindly, open-minded nuns, too. And um, I love Lois Smith's character. I actually feel Lois Smith was kind of underappreciated this year. Very she much did. so, yeah. There was also a, an Marjorie interesting Prime. movie, Marjorie Prime, which is another one of those movies that I think was overlooked, okay. um, that had kind of a spiritual sense, too, because it's about bringing people back that you, after you've lost them. And, and I just feel like that's a character that I would have liked to have seen more of. Well, and what's interesting about Lady Bird is that when you, you said she somewhat like rejected her Catholic um, schooling, but she also rejected Sacramento, the Sacramento area. And at the end, someone said, or it's like, not, you don't hate it. Like, you're writing about it. You're passionate. Obviously, you love it. Yes. Like, because she was always writing about that. She was always, so there was something there. Yeah. Um, and that's, hence, we have the story, because it's, you know, autobiographical. So she's rejected right. Sacramento and the sacraments. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Pine. Pine. I mean, it's pine. one of those things where the root is probably, it's not even a pun. It's just Gone so, it's like if it's come back to become a pun again, because obviously the rude is like, anyways. I am so sorry to get That's probably how you say it in another language. Just like come in, go. For me, um, I wouldn't, I, I don't know that I have a most spiritually significant film, but Three Billboards is kind of a spiritual film for me. Um, there were a few things that struck me about it. Um, well, the Woody Harrelson character with the cancer. Um, I, maybe perhaps because my father died of cancer, but I felt that it dealt with a lot of the themes of like life, death, um, also the whole hate begets hate. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, the new relationship that was quote unquote supposed to be the opposite of hate, seeing two people that were former, and I'm this is kind of spoiler alert, but former enemies kind of coming together and how much, you know, and it, it speaks to what's going on in our time. It's like, here are people who are, you know, um, hating each other and against each other, and then they come together for a common purpose. And then there's, I, I felt that there was a message there about unconditional love with the mother and the daughter, you know, and what that unconditional love means, the importance of that unconditional love, and what you'll do, what lengths you'll go to for those you love, um, which very much to me speaks to sort of like just how we try to deal with biblical love, you know, and, and loving mm -hmm. those, you know, love your enemies. Um, and crossing those lines um, versus racism versus, you know, um, a lot of different things that are going on. I guess yeah. I would throw Call Me Violence. By Your Name in there as well, too, because mm -hmm. the scene in which the father speaks to his son mm, about love. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful scene. And it's, um, again, it's, you know, as a father, he's, you know, his love for his son and then his saying to him, you know, embrace love and, and, and you know, kind of, a little bit of his own rue or regret, but um, also his, just his expansiveness and yeah. his caring and openness. So there's a spiritual element there, I think. Um, I have one more, can I throw in? Um, yeah, also, sure. yeah, for me, uh, most spiritual significant, I mean, Lady Bird is up there. Um, a film not many people saw and which didn't get any Oscar nominations, um, A Quiet Passion. Mm. Terrence Davies' uh, biographical drama about Emily Dickinson, played by Cynthia oh. Nixon in probably my favorite performance of the year. She deserved to get an Oscar nomination. I really wish, I mean, no, question. no for sure. I think she's, she's so great it. in that movie. I think it was, um, I, whoever they didn't, it was, you know, And it came out studio. in the early part of the year. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's a, it's a challenging film. Um, but you, you, it starts, the movie starts with Emily Dickinson being kind of like, you know, leaving the uh, kind of parochial school where she, where she where she is kind of challenging the nuns. I mean, it's a lot of a lot of a lot of nun movies this year. <laughs> um, and sisters. You know, Novitiate is another. Yeah, but where and it's right. the movie is really charting. You know, it's from her, her you know, almost cradle to grave, not quite, but you know, you, it charts her spiritual journey. And she grows up in this household where it's very you know fairly quite strictly religious. But within that, there's this a lot of room for argument. This is a house where, like, her father. She's having a lot of the movie. There, she's having these arguments with her father about and and with like and I think a preacher and just saying like how you know she says like 
she believes in God, but she doesn't want to like, she doesn't want to go to church. And it's, it's just, there are all these little issues and it's, it's about how this kind of like strict kind of religious kind of upbringing can coexist with this sort of intellectual and artistic freedom, which enabled her to become one of the great poets of all time. So yeah. it's a wonderful movie. And I say it because I don't think a lot of people seen it. Um, and I totally hope Birds people, people to absolutely it. would see yeah. it. Yeah. So what about maybe a film that you think shouldn't be in the Ooh. Best Picture <laughs> nominee? Oh. So mine might be, um, I liked Shape of Water. Yeah. Um, I was surprised at how many nominations I agree completely it got. with you. Yeah. I mean, I saw it. Yeah, I saw it and I thought, I mean, I like, I also loved Pan's Labyrinth. I thought that was actually a better film. Me too. Um, much better. Yes. But, um, but yeah, I thought Shape of Water was interesting. Um, fun, entertaining, but not, um, it's, it's one of those. It was Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> you know, I was kind of. It is, totally Beauty and the Beast. I feel like I've seen this story and I felt like the, the people that we were, yes, it was about outsiders, but it was, they were kind of obvious outsiders mm -hmm. and there wasn't enough to their love story. I just felt like it, it left me somewhat cold. It's, I mean, it there is. There wasn't enough to their yeah. love story, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry. It, it is an interesting movie to talk about in terms of diversity and representation because, you know, you have Octavia Spencer, a black woman, you have. Richard Jenkins playing a gay man, and it's it is about as you said, you know, minorities rising up. But there almost seems to be something a little programmatic about mm -hmm. that. Did you strike you? I don't know. I feel like I, I, I you almost know, I think formulaic. it's a little form, you know, formulaic yeah. about it, and that to me didn't entirely cohere or ring true, especially even though I admire the movie just on the level of I think it's beautiful. I think it's you know, it's yes. it's beautiful a lovely film. Yeah. It's a daring film. Yeah. I do think, but it's not. There's something about it that is a little. Almost complacent to me. me weirdly too. enough, I actually think it's like for a movie where you know you have a, a woman, a mute woman, falling in love with a fish man. You want a little more surprise. Actually. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's even weird to say, more but you know, it's egg, like right? yeah. more than a hard-boiled no, egg. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, yeah. like, their whole relationships revolves around the egg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, and then the kind of the most interesting scene was just, oh, the whole house becomes a fish tank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. So, visually, it was, it was quite stunning. I agree with you. Magic realism yeah. that yes. we can expect from yeah. Guillermo, Guillermo del, Toro, del Toro. Of course. And yeah. I mean, and that's why it's such a beautiful film. Yes, But no I question. agree. And for me, I know I want to be emotionally invested and engaged. And I sometimes feel that the character development, with that one, it was spread amongst the characters and trying to do sort of the, um, the Cold War, you know, theme or whatever. Maybe trying to so, do too much. Yeah, maybe yeah. not as uh, much character development, you know. Individually. I think some yeah. of that Cold War subplot, the plotting is just kind of, ugh, it's, I'm crazy Although Michael crazy Stolbarg is in three of he's, the Oscar yeah. Best Pictures, and that guy should he's have great. been nominated. He should have been nominated, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, he's not great. Not for that movie necessarily, that. call me by your name probably, but. Yeah. And it's interesting that we all feel that way because there's been such a momentum for Shape of Water, mm -hmm. and it's like, who is it that loves this movie so much? I think people do, and I think people do. And for some, for, I've talked to a lot of people. For them, that is the emotional movie of the year. That yeah. movie moved. It didn't move me that way no. even nearly. But I think people are having that reaction. So to each their like, own. I feel like no, it should have been Pan's Labyrinth. That's when he should have gotten Best yeah. Picture. Mm. Before, Which and Pan's Labyrinth did win, you know, a bunch of Oscars too. But this one is like the one that was. I wonder though, because I think like Del Toro, everyone loves him. Everyone loves Guillermo. He's lovable. This is his yes. moment. Yeah. The movie had a ton of craft nominations, understandably so. So who won Best Director? It's one Best Director, and I think yeah. so. But that's why I think you know even. Even though it seems to be maybe the best picture front runner, I don't know that it is. I'd be serious. I, I feel like I it could not. very well win. It's <laughs> statistically and everything. It looks like the smart, you know, money is for that to win. But I don't know that it will. Well, it's, share yeah. a little bit about what you wrote in that article about sure. yeah. best picture front runners because I thought that was so fascinating. <laughs> I think that what's and this all ties into what we've been saying about you know it's there's the changing kind of uh, makeup of the Academy, which I think is I think we're starting to see some of that, but we're but it's still kind of very much a project in its early stages. Um, but what I really think the biggest uh, the most ground that's been broken is happened you know almost ten years ago when they expanded the best picture field from five nominees to ten nominees, and now it's like anywhere between five and ten. There's nine nominees this year, and what that did was it opened it up to I think a lot of smaller films. It's funny because it was it was engineered in mind to bring in movies like The Dark Knights and the, the superhero <laughs> movies, uh, and none of those have been nominated. But it's really oh. been to the benefit of smaller movies, yeah. mid-budget movies, movies for grown-ups, quote unquote, you know, and so, and I think be also because now they've gone to this preferential ballot where it's not, you don't just vote for one, 
movie, you rank them. And so what oh. that does is it's completely changed the dynamics of the race. That's why in the past five years or so, we've seen four times best director and picture have gone to two different movies. Mm -hmm. That did not happen all that much back mm -hmm. then. Here it's like now and you see like they'll give like best director to Quaron for Gravity because it's a stunning technical achievement, but they'll give best picture to uh, 12 Years a Slave because it's the movie that perhaps moves them more or, is, or sends them more important message. So you see this now, like the bigger, technically splashier movie tends to win best director, but picture, goes maybe towards a smaller movie, mm -hmm. like Moonlight, like mm -hmm. Spotlight, and uh, something that maybe is more meaningful. To, and and that's an, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I think it's uh, I think it's an interesting dynamic, and I think it's but I do think it's good. Perhaps I would say because it has expanded the definition of what kind of film can win Best Picture, and it's no longer just equating you know the big juggernaut, whether it's Titanic or Avatar. You know, um, it's gonna you know <laughs> Titanic won, um, Avatar didn't, and that was already actually kind of the beginning of that. That was the very first year, in fact, Hurt Locker beat Avatar, and that was already, that's, that, you know, so the David changed. and Goliath narrative yeah. of that is already, you know, yeah. And that brings up one film that we didn't talk about yet, which is Dunkirk. Yes. So, and I'd like to hear who you guys think is gonna win for Best Director, because Dunkirk is that big, splashy, mm -hmm. you know, historical, um, I don't know what the budget was, but it, it, it has that, that feeling. But that I don't we think Christopher Nolan is as beloved as Guillermo del Toro, no, and I think not. that's the. So I you think, think this Guillermo case, del Toro is going to win for I best director? I think he's going to win for best director. I think not only is it's not just a question of being beloved. Obviously, he's he's extremely technically, you know, he's got technical wizardry. He's right. he's a fantastic director. He's got this imagination that is you know no one else has. He's just very unique. Oh so gosh, I think yeah. you couple that with the fact that he's also a well liked person, mm -hmm. whereas Christopher Nolan is a fantastic director. Um, I don't know if this would be the movie I would give it to him for, but right. but there is that feeling mm -hmm. like, oh, he's overdue. So there, some of that enters into it, but I still think it's going to be Del Toro. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm a huge Christopher Nolan fan, and it's hard to believe that this is his first directing nomination. He should have been nominated um, before. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I would have given, I would have nominated him for The Dark Knight sure. or for in, uh, Inception or, or Memento or something like that. I even liked um, Insomnia going Insomnia. way back. Yeah, for yeah. sure. No, he's, but I think yeah, it Memento. speaks to, he is hugely respected. Um, he is a little, you know, chilly perhaps. He is not this big, warm personality, although he's extremely eloquent and, you know, engaged, loves to engage with audiences, but he's like, you know, he's like, He's like Kubrick in a way. He's like, oh, this general, and people will laugh at me, and like, people, you know, will, 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 will scorn the idea that he's in the same, pan, you know, pantheon as Kubrick. But he has that kind of sensibility where it's really about this kind of rigorous sort of cinema that he practices. And so I really like, you know, Dunkirk is not even my favorite of his movies either, right. but I really yeah. admire it enormously. Mm -hmm. I, I admire think it, it is, more than I like. I it. think it's a stunning, you know, I, yeah. and I think that he will get a lot of votes. And you know, I don't think I think Del Toro has it pretty in the bag. But mm -hmm. if there is an upset, it could be Nolan. I think he's um, next in line for sure. Yeah. Next in line, but it is interesting because you have like, it's like he directed a World War II epic. What more does he have to do, Academy? I know. <laughs> While putting his I know. own spin on it, it's this very kind of, it's, it's almost like, it's a very classical movie, but it's also very avant-garde almost in the way it's structurally kind of, you know, yeah. the, the time frames and everything. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I, I just find it interesting that you guys are talking about the personalities of these directors, that that actually <laughs> factors into yeah. the oh, voting process. Oh, the it does, yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, not the audience, of course, it as is much, but. a popularity contest. It's it high school. Is. The Academy really? is high school. Remember it's coming like here. here. Like me? Yeah. yeah. There's, there's oh, always no. the campaigns leading up that, you know, there's a lot, there's campaigning and pushing. And well, why so. do you think Catherine Bigelow beat out Cameron? <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, there's yeah. a person who's, you know, there are people there that. Too. And the narrative was irresistible, too, and it's like, and all these things, you know, and people are sort of, people are sort of scripting the show in their minds. They mm. want Del Toro to get up there. They want to hear, hear his speech. Mm -hmm. She's going to go on there. Yeah. You know, God forbid uh, the conductor will play Guillermo Del Toro off the stage. But you don't want that to happen. But, well, and, um, and, and yeah. in defense of them, I guess, I don't know, but they know these people. You know, they work right. with them, a lot of them. So there is, it's a little, it'd be, it's not the same as like, uh, it's a popularity contest because they actually do know them. Right. But I think the personalities do come into play, Nancy. It's it's very true. Like with, I think that's why Alison Janney is going to win. Not, and I'm not a I'm not a really big fan of her performance in I Tonya, but she's a wonderful actress who's won seven Emmy awards. She's beloved. Right. They love giving it to kind of TV actors who kind of you know, make good now in, yes. in the film and and you know and has been on the circuit all over the place. It's like that's. The campaigning aspect is and very Frances much. And Frances McDormand is another one of those, very much so. because she's. I mean, she's a fantastic actress, but she's also so admired. Um, so yeah, I think you know, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not obviously it's not the best picture or the best performance. Right. It's a lot of other things. So you think Allison J. So what about lead actress? 
Um, so you think it's going to go to Sally Hawkins? No, Francis McDormand. No, I think McDormand. Francis McDormand. Oh, Francis. Yeah. Oh, you just also, said yeah. Francis yeah. McDormand. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. No, and three billboards. Yeah. yeah. No, she's going to. Oh, wow. She's. I don't think there's even a contest. I, in some ways, I'd love to see it go to Saoirse Ronan because I think she's fantastic, but she's got this huge career ahead of her, and right. she's great in everything. So we know she'll win an Oscar at some point. Right. Um, but uh, I loved her performance. I thought it was yeah, amazing. Yeah, I do too. That also leads to a question. Well, let's let's talk about best actor and then I have a question about the post but who do you guys think is going to get best actor? Oh, Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman, yeah. 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 They're really, oh, for we all have Tower. kind of the same actors. There are not many surprises in store this year I think and if there are so picture. much better. Best Except picture. for best picture yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Maybe so. Uh, I think there, I think whatever wins might be either a big surprise or not a surprise at all but with director and the four acting categories it's it's pretty, pretty much in cut the bag. and dry because mm -hmm. all the same people have won the same awards. But you know what's everywhere. interesting about the Gary Oldman thing? Okay, so last year Casey Affleck won. Mm -hmm. Casey Affleck was accused of some sexual harassment and, and abuse, right? So this year, if that performance happened, if that movie was up this year, he would never have won. Mm -hmm. He's not coming to the. He's not even coming, Oscars, right? So we're living in different right. times now. Yeah. But Gary Oldman has also been accused by a former wife of abuse, yes. and no one talks about that. And I wonder what's the difference here? Is it because it was a marital situation? Is going mm -hmm. off topic a little bit, but I also wonder, you know, because we are living in different times oh, yeah. to a certain extent, but no one seems to be bringing that issue up. And I'm not sure that they should. I'm not even saying that it should or shouldn't be, but I just think it's interesting. Yeah, um, that is interesting. And I wonder how much um, that's going to, what we're going to see in terms of the Me Too movement. Is there, I didn't know, is there anything that they're doing the, at the... I haven't heard of anything wonder, planned. Yeah. The I way mean, that Golden Globes, everybody's wearing black all and all black that. black at the Golden yeah. Globes. But yeah. I haven't heard anything specific. No, okay, for the Oscars. Right, but yeah. I do wonder about Gary Oldman. And I, and his one of his ex-wives is the actress that's in um, Leslie, Leslie Mando. Mando. Yeah. That's not the one. Yeah. She's not, not the, the one ones, accusing yeah. Yes, but I remember five I'm, times. I'm, yes. yeah. Oh, so, my God. Yeah, it was a couple wives ago. But, um, <laughs> but it's, just, it's interesting but, to me. And also even just the performance, getting back to the meat of that. Right. To me, it was just kind of, you know, he tends to be hammy, choose the scenery. He yells a lot. I'm mean, not saying that he wasn't good in this performance, but there's there's that element. I I tend to prefer subtler performances. Um, he had some subtle moments with the woman who played his secretary. I don't know what who, yes, what actress yeah. that was, but there were some subtle moments there. But I mean, obviously, his performance is varied. Like he does have those big, you know. And Churchill was totally, larger than life too. Yeah. He's playing that mm -hmm. character, so there's that. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Gary Oldman, who can be, um, who can be a very, you know, hammy, showy actor, and is also a very subtle actor at yes, times. Yes, he can you know, be We both. talked about, you know, yeah. it's like I loved him in Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, where he was nominated a few years ago. It was his first nomination. I think that wow. was. I think that's probably one of the best performances he's ever given. And this one, it's fine. He's gonna win. You know, you, I'd love to you see pile like on the makeup, Palooza you win an Oscar, win. it's great. But <laughs> yeah. I, well, but, it's like almost uh, yeah. the film, it was created for him. I mean, yeah. the film wouldn't even exist without him because it's for basically sure. him talking for two hours. <laughs> you know? I mean, there's like no action, it's yeah. just him talking as Churchill. Well, and then you have John Lithgow doing Churchill in, on The Crown. Mm -hmm. He does just as good of a job in another yeah. way. Yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Do you think, so Steven Spielberg didn't get nominated for Best Director um, with The Post. Thoughts about that? It's kind of a mediocre movie, I think. I mean, I think that <laughs> uh, Spotlight did it better. You know, and not the same movie, obviously, but it would doing movies about journalism. Yeah. Um, it's a perfectly competent movie. I mean, he's not going to make a bad movie. It's got Meryl Streep. Yeah, it's got Meryl yeah. Streep, and not, and not one of her better performances either, but a right. perfectly good oh, performance. Really? I think this is the best thing she's done in a while. I mean, I don't know, maybe not, I don't know if it's one for the, yeah. for the record, but, yeah, I think, yeah. but I think... Well, it's better than Mamma Mia. <laughs> <laughs> Which we have to look forward to again, right? So, Mamma I think, Mia, too. But I mean, it's funny because this was, the, you know, Meryl Streep can just, you know, people say whatever, she, she coughs and she gets nominated. Right. And here's a role actually where I think she actually does deserve it. But the movie, and I like the movie a lot actually. I think it's a very good movie. Um, I think though it's the fact that it was sort of overlooked, it only got two nominations, one Best Picture, one Actress, um, speaks to the idea that you can't quite engineer an Oscar even if you throw so in not, Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep It's like people were joking. That yeah. was the joke the whole yeah. season. Spielberg, Streep, Hanks is going to, yeah. you know, uh, Seth Meyers on, on the Golden Globe said like, oh, let's, you know, they made, they made a joke about it. And, but it hasn't won anything. Yeah. And I think people feel that. They don't like feeling pressured. They don't like being told what to do. Yeah. And I think it kind of, you know, the, it, the, the, thing, the story behind this movie was this is the movie that's going to tell the story of the, the Washington Post publishing the Pentagon Papers. Actually, the New York Times did it, but, you know, broke the story. But yeah. how the Post then picked up mm -hmm. and ran with that baton. 
Um, and this was going to be a movie that was going to resonate enormously in the Trump era. Which and is why he be, did it when he did you know, it. He rushed it into... I think in a way, it's yeah. like what, what gave it that reg- re- resonance and that urgency is also what hurt the movie. I think that they were trying to almost re- reverse engineer this kind of significance, and they did it too quickly, and it just seemed a little too obvious. And maybe and even, it's not a know. film that really emotionally engages you either, you know. Um, I did have moments of feeling for Meryl Streep, particularly yep. when she was in the room yes. with all of the men and yes. they were ignoring her. Great moments. Yeah, those those are the best moments of the movie, I think. Yeah. It's sort of like watching this woman come into her own mm-hmm. as a, a powerful uh, working woman and she hadn't been that. Right. Who inherited so. the paper from yeah, her husband? Yeah, yeah. And was, suicide, if her husband hadn't died, she wouldn't be there. Yeah. yeah. What do, What do you guys think about the Big Sick? It kind of oh, I love got that movie. Um, slightly overlooked in other categories, and it could be that film that could be considered that smaller film of like, but it didn't get nominated for yeah. Best Picture. But a lot of people loved it. It did get nominated for Best Original Screenplay. Um, any thoughts about the Big Sick? I think it could have been in that tenth slot. I think you know, Florida Project, Big Sick, mm-hmm. even Wonder Woman could have been in that tenth slot. Um, it would have been fun to see yeah. that. Um, but yeah, I, I think Big Sick is a wonderful movie, and um, maybe it seemed a little slight for for the voters. But of course, and and you know, with the screenplay nomination, you have ten chances, I guess. And, sure. Um, and I think for for me, it's kind of an honorable mention, Best Picture sometimes. Yeah. You know, because you're saying it's such a well-written movie, and sometimes the best movies rise up in the screenplay category. But I, I, yeah. it probably doesn't have much of a chance up against Get Out and, and Lady Bird, And Lady Bird and Three Billboards It's a, it's and it's a really good yeah. year for original, original screenplay, screenplay yeah. and adapted screenplay. Not as much. Not as much. Yeah. It's going to be Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, I like, I like The Big Sick a lot. Um, you know, I think, and that movie premiered at Sundance along with Get Out. Oh Call Me By gosh. Your Name and Mudbound, Sundance good 2017. It was a really good Sundance. Yeah. And, um, you know, just goes to show, but that was very early in the year. And, you know, the movie was a hit and everything, but perhaps it was perceived ultimately that it's just, just a romantic comedy, which I always chafe against that kind of thing, you know, because I think genres should be, should be, should be a level playing field. Um, you know, Holly Hunter and Ray Romano are so wonderful, <laughs> quite apart from even Kumail Nanjiani and, Emily and Zoe Kazan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, it, yeah. It's, so it's like, but those two performances, I think, in a in a less competitive year, might have might have broken through as mm-hmm, well, because mm-hmm. those are in a year full of great parent roles. I think those are two of the best. Yeah. It's true, and the interaction. I loved the fact that he got to know her parents. Yeah. You don't see movies about people getting to know other people's parents. <laughs> you just don't. <laughs> and it's an important role as a, you know, getting to know your spouse's parents or whatever. I'd, that's something. It's no one's really explored that in films very much. So I, that's not like meet the parents, but that's not it's right. It's kind of you know this sort of you know, and of course, just you know, the matter of getting to know this Pakistani young man and you know, and, what, and, and a Muslim family and that whole you know, I think, you know. Just the, the the culture clash elements, the kind of you know what it's like to be a first or second generation you know a child of immigrant parents, and when you don't you know really adhere to your parents' religion anymore, and all of these things. I mean, but you respect it, your parents, it, and you don't want to upset them, and yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and with your choice of spouse, it's like all of that uh, felt so incredibly fresh yeah. and wonderful to experience. And again, it kind of the experience. Why haven't we seen this more often? Yeah. Oh, it's like, and this is and this is what's wonderful. I think about inclusive storytelling and representational stories, even something like Wonder Woman. Um, it's like a lot of people knocked it as like, oh, it's just kind of an ordinary movie. It's like, well, it's an ordinary movie, but you know, you realize when you put a woman in there, when you told us, it's like everything old becomes new again, mm-hmm. right? And it's yes. like, and suddenly these movies, ha- these things that I guess if you strip them on paper, they seem kind of unremarkable become remarkable because right. it, it feels like a revelation. Right. You know? I feel so. like with everything old becomes new again, Wonder Woman seeing a woman as the hero, the superhero, you know, in a superhero movie. And for me, even though this isn't 2017, Black, Black Panther, Panther yes. seeing yes. an African-American exactly. man, Incredible. not the third, you know, yes. friend of right. the superhero or whatever, right. but the superhero. And the whole world and of Black people in Africa. I could just Africa. gush about Black Panther. Yeah, about that'll it. be next year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be doing this next go. year, talking to gush now. Hopefully we'll be talking yeah. about Black Panther yeah. next year for Oscar Panther, nominations. It just, it, it just feels like, and we're not, we're not gonna, I won't go on, but it, it feels like the culmination of everything. We're yes. it's, like it's, it's like a movie, but it's a world. Into, it's, yeah. yeah. So it's much great. there. Yeah. Um, what do you guys feel about uh, the disaster artists and James Franco kind of being, <laughs> I mean, I know, I know yeah. that's a thing because he had a, 
He well, that's some, why you know that uh, you know Casey Affleck wouldn't have made it this year. James Franco right. is the. Right. But in terms child, of the but. film, in terms of, and I know there's like the cult following to the film, and so any thoughts about because it did get nominated for best adapted screenplay, but I think that might have been the only. Yeah, yeah. and it's not going to win. And in recent, you know, just I think yesterday that lawsuit was yes. announced. Yes, one of his one students. Of the writers, yeah, one of yeah. these, and you know, was only paid five thousand dollars and was swindled. Apparently, allegedly, you know, the the law, the the, the suit. Well, alleges, there's also so. a lawsuit about calling by your name. This is when the lawsuits come out of the woodwork. Is there calling by your name lawsuit? Yes. Yes. Always yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm not calling like, by your name. I'm shape sorry. of water. Shape yes. of water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which yeah. seems yeah. very fishy. Yes, it does. Sorry. It does. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, yeah, this is the time when those, the, the, whether these are smear campaigns or, although I think with the Disaster Artist one, they, you know, that was after voting closed, so it wouldn't affect the results at all. But as for the movie itself, um, I like the movie a lot. I think it's, I think it's funny. I don't it's fun. love it. It's fun. Yeah. Um, I think it's a fascinating movie about failure and about how you kind of mock and yet celebrate this object that is completely taken on a life of its own. Um, and I enjoy, and I actually think James Franco actually did give a really great performance as Tommy Wiseau. I mean, I think he's real, you, you feel like you were watching Tommy Wiseau for like two hours. <laughs> so it's, it's an amazing transformation. Yeah. Um, and yet, and it doesn't surprise me at all though that, you know, these allegations, whatever, which have been out there for a while, caught up with him. And just, I think we're seeing too, just the timing of these things because he won the Golden Globe for best actor right. in a comedy. And then I think just a little while later, these things broke right during the voting period. And I think the Academy is breathing a huge sigh of relief that he wasn't nominated for an Oscar in the end. So it's just like the speed of these things, yeah. which is both, you know, kind of, you know, heartening and a little disturbing, I think, because it's like, you know, I think in these cases, in this case, perhaps the, the the allegations were well substantiated, and it was not just one accuser. But I think the speed of it is like, it's a little it's a little unsettling, isn't it? Just that we're in this we're in the middle of this season where we're handing out statues right and left, and yet all everybody's you know the, these skeletons are kind of popping out of closets. We're in right the and thick left. of it, and it just yeah. feels like okay, so you're handing you know you're handing awards out, and then you're handing out you know, allegations, right? It's just it's just kind and, of and social yeah. Social media has so much more to deal with that because a lot of women came forth in yeah. social media. Now social media just delivers us information like instantly, and there's there's always opinions and thoughts, and we're you know getting it you know. A lot um, of times, no fact checking, and just kind right, of right, exactly. Yeah. But so it can happen, you know, at those times. It used to be like it would be a newspaper article that you right. read about someone, but now it could be somebody tweeting that something happened to them or posting. Even it on the their news Facebook. outlets like the season sorry came out of. Babe.net. Yeah, Nets. what was that about? No so, one ever heard of Babe.net right, so until the, then. So, yeah. so even because of blogging and kind of news medium, you know, people can kind of post things and there's not kind of a, there's no vetting, right? I'm right. not saying that that was wrong, but it was just the one story. But everyone pretty much, I mean, the story just went on and on and on. Even yeah. Saturday Night Live had a whole sketch about it <laughs> on Babe.net. Babe. No, <laughs> right. I don't know what, yeah. that, what that news outlet, but it's just, I think, yeah, we are in a kind of proliferation of news. And right? we're in a, in a clickbait, yes. you know, kind of climate. Yes. So yes. there's all of that too, to add to it. It makes it complicated. It's an interesting discussion that's being had. I mean, even uh, Uma Thurman's story reported by Maureen Dowd at the New York Times, but in the opinion section and a story that yeah. was widely criticized for the way it was reported and written and that there were, you know, just, and I think that's true. It's like people are, it's open this whole debate about journalism. How do we report these responsibly and effectively, you know? So, and then we've got the know. whole political debate about journalism and fake well, news. <laughs> while there are, you know, this is a very interesting time. There's a lot of, you know, issues. We talk about women's issues, the Me Too movement, but we have our first nominee for cinematographer, Rachel Morrison. So you guys think she might win? Anybody think? Thoughts? Yeah, she could. Yes, uh, you know, I think it's very possible. I heard somewhere that apparently she got very loud applause, maybe the loudest applause at the Academy Award luncheon? nominees luncheon. Interesting. Wow. And I am just pleased that, uh, given that Mudbound was distributed on Netflix, that people were able to judge the visual quality. That's a really film. important and point because I, there's yeah. been that whole kind of anti-Netflix, anti-Amazon kind of thinking, mm -hmm. and that shows that we're getting right. past that. Mm -hmm. But Shape of Water might. It's probably going to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or actually, I 
Roger Deakins, finally, yeah. who's the longtime Oscar bridesmaid for Blade Runner 2049. Oh, I actually think right. he, people are thinking this will be the film. Oh, and that would be very well yeah. deserved. Yes. I don't think anyone would argue with giving Roger Deakins an Oscar finally for that movie. Right, because he hasn't gotten an Oscar yet, yeah. Roger Deakins, yeah, yeah, Blade Runner. And the cinematography in that was beautiful as yes, well. Yes, it was. Interesting yeah. that Rachel Morrison was nominated, but um, Dee Reese, is it Dee Reese? Yes, was, was not. not. Yeah, I think she should have been in there too. Yeah. But for director. For she director. Was for, she is guys, for screenplay. Do you guys yeah, think that for, yeah. um, Greta Herwig should have been nominated for best director? Does it? I love that movie and I love Greta Gerwig. I think she, but um, yeah, I feel like she's, you know, it's one of those things where when a director, uh, I mean, when an actor directs, oftentimes there's a lot of attention to that. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone like Dee Reese is, you know, maybe went under the radar because of that. She's been a director and a writer. Um, and Gerwig is another one of those beloved people, you know, um, and she's played this whole uh, Oscar campaign really well. She's charming and, but humble. And so, um, and she has been in kind of the shadow. She has been co-writing and maybe even co-directing for all we know with a lot of men in some of the films that she's been involved with. And so she's finally com come out from behind their shadow or, you know, so I, there's a lot that I'm, I'm glad to see her in there. I Absolutely think she deserves to be nominated, yeah. I would say. I just yeah. think, and I think that people sometimes will misjudge the, you know, because it's a quote unquote small film, right. you know, what she does in that movie, the tonal precision, mm -hmm. the way the way she stitches that together, that is so difficult. I think we see a lot of character driven movies. We saw, we see a lot of, you know, in, in the indie world, there are a lot of relationship, family relationship films. Um, I think Lady Bird really does stand apart from the, the rest of the pack. And so, it, yeah, I agree yeah. with you. And I think well, it's it's a subtle kind of thing. And because it's it seems so easy, is why it probably was a lot more difficult than and precise than mm -hmm. we know. Oh, we're starting to run out of time. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that was fast. Um, anything, I mean, I don't know if Nancy, if you had anything more that you wanted to ask. Um, um, do, does the Oscars matter, right? Mm. I think that's kind of the, the is, it, is it becoming irrelevant or is it, does it really make a difference in terms of helping artists in Hollywood, you know, grow their careers? What do you guys think? I think to, to uh, you may have found this with your students, I know the students I teach, to them the Oscars don't matter at all. Mm -hmm. um, but so it may be to a, you know, younger generations, it's gonna be less and less important. Right. I think it's, they, it still matters within the industry um, to a certain extent. I think what, what wins best, best picture matters but most people, you know, some of the other categories, maybe not so much. I don't know, what do you think, Jessica? I think it does matter still. I mean, you know, the ratings, they're always complaining the ratings are in the toilet or whatever, and it's like, that's fine. The people who don't care about, you know, about movie awards or movies, there, you know, there will always be an audience who, you know, who watches the Oscars. We follow it obsessively because it's part of our jobs. <laughs> and, you know, the se season has gone on, it feels like longer than ever. But I think that, um, who wins does matter, I think that, and it's interesting because here you're seeing the dovetailing of the prestige that an Academy Award can carry and the representational concerns of the industry. Those things are dovetailing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, when Greta Gerwig and Jordan Peele are, you know, and, and Guillermo del Toro are, the Oscar, are, are among the nominees for best director, that absolutely matters. And it's like, it, it, it's this concrete kind of milestone that says, okay, this is one, you know, it doesn't mean that we've solved diversity. Absolutely not. But mm -hmm. it is a milestone. It is a marker that we can set down and, and say, I, okay, yes. yes, we've done this. And also what next? for the executives who say, oh, no, no, you know, that doesn't sell or whatever, A, the box office, yes. you know, something like. Yeah. Uh, Lady Bird can get out two of the, you know, yeah. two of the yeah. box office success stories of the year, for example. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah. so, so it, in terms of their green lighting other projects, I think it matters for what we're going to see in the future. Cool. Where will you be watching the Oscars? I was invited to a party um, at the Hollywood Roosevelt, which Ooh, is across the street. So the Hollywood Roosevelt. I used to cover it for across years and years. I would always be there. Yes. But starting last year, I wasn't. And last year was the best year to be there because it was a twist ending. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh yeah. I'm hosting a party this year oh, for the first time. Awesome. So. I actually haven't, it's getting late. I haven't decided yet. I might be in the <laughs> office or I might be somewhere else, but I will have to be on deadline. So. He's got all kinds of good dishes. Oh, He's deadline. got phantom bread. He's cooking up and all I'm kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, yeah. the, the darkest the, flower. Yeah, yes. darkest <laughs> flower. I'll be at the Producers Guild, yeah. the PGA oh, party. Cool. Oh, fun. And uh, as Justin just told me, um, it sounds like Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway are coming back this they year. Are. So <laughs> we might be into a <laughs> thing again this year. We don't know. Anyway, this has been such a really fun talk and very informative. Um, um, we hope that you enjoyed it. We want to thank you on behalf of Biola Cinema Media Arts, 
Um, don't forget, if you put a comment, you'll be entered for a drawing. And if you want to hear more about great events and talks like this that Biola CMA is doing, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. So this was really fun. Once again, we want to thank our guests, Claudia Puig, Nancy Yoon, Justin Chang, and I'm Camille Tucker. We'll see you at another great CMA event. Thank you.